Welcome to the program. I trust that you have had a wonderful weekend and a wonderful time seeking God. We have a lot to be thankful to God for in Trinidad and Tobago because as you know for the past almost a month there has not been any visible sign of the COVID-19 pandemic in our country. And we give God all the praise and the glory for this. I know that you have been praying along with many of the believers in our country and around the world. And while we are an island, we are not an island in isolation. We have to remember other parts of the world where this thing is still a scourge, where people are still losing loved ones, when people are still being afflicted, where economies are being devastated. It's not all over until it is all over. And this is the time when we understand we are our brother's keeper and we need to keep on praying that God will give victory not just in our country but around the world. Because as long as this thing exists in any part of the world, no other part of the world is immune. Because this is a global village. The world has become now a global village with all the different means of transportation where it can be in any part of the world in the next 24 hours. So we must not forget that we owe it to our own well-being to be praying for other islands in the Caribbean, other parts of the world where this thing is seemingly unabated. And I believe that God is going to answer a prayer. Call your friends. Let them know that the Rhema Hour is on the air right now by way of Facebook and the YouTube. We are doing deliverance. And I'm so thankful to God as I have been informed of the tremendous responses that we are getting and that the blessing that many have receiving because of these programs, to him we give all the praise and the honor and the glory. And we are so thankful for you folk who have been so faithful in telling your friends and your acquaintances to just simply get on the platform. I am so delighted when I move about with it very seldom, just as recently as this morning, I was actually talking to a person I haven't seen for a long time. And he pointed to me, I'm looking at you. And he said, I'm being so blessed, Pastor Anthony. And I was really encouraged because this is a person whom I hadn't seen for a very, very long time. And to know that people are connecting. And we can connect with one another. Even though we haven't seen them physically. This is a blessing that we must not take for granted. So welcome again, and today we are believing God for deliverance. We are believing God that somebody whom we are speaking to will find that long-awaited deliverance. I want you to emphasize, to emphasize to you, beloved, that it may be a long time you have been suffering. It has not got to be sickness. It might be a problem. It might be a family relationship. It might be a job relationship. It might be financial. Something that you need to get the victory from. And I want you to know, beloved, in this message, looking at the bigger picture, it's going to be a blessing to you. Turn with me to your Bible, to the book of St. John's Gospel, chapter 11. And I'm not going to read any particular verse for the time being because we know that the whole thing concerns the raising of Lazarus from the dead. This is a story that we all know quite well. And I want to just simply point out certain highlights from this. If perchance I did not get through the entire thing today, I will continue next week Thursday. But I'm going to be able to say enough that even though I didn't conclude the message, 
it will be enough for me to pray and to believe God with you for your deliverance. So let me ask you, what does this scripture really mean to you? I know many people look at the book of John chapter 11 and they like the part that say it had the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. <laughs> and that's all they know about it. But there's something more than that, beloved. And I want to just simply you know, point it out to you. There's something more than verse 35 that Jesus wept. And it, look at verse 4 of John chapter 11. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Underline that, because we are going to be spending most of this afternoon upon that particular verse. Now, it concerned three people, Martha, Mary, and Joseph. And verse 1 tells you how it begin. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now Bethany was about two miles outside of Jerusalem, on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. So therefore it wasn't very far, just two miles. But Jesus was in a place called Bethabara, was about 18 miles from Bethany. This young man named Lazarus became ill. And the sisters, Martha and Mary, and these people meant a lot to Jesus. I'm not quite sure if this incident where Martha, where Mary actually wiped the feet of Jesus with her hair, if that happened after or before, but just for the sake of let you understanding who they were, this was the same Mary that wept at the feet of Jesus and took her hair and wiped his feet. And Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So they were very special people to the Lord. He loved them because they seemed to have understood the fact that he was not just another prophet, but that he was the Messiah. He was God's son. Therefore, when Lazarus became sick, they were hoping that any time that Jesus would come on the scene. But as the days went by, there was no Jesus. For as you read from the end of chapter 10, Jesus was in Bethabara around the same place where John the Baptist was baptizing or baptized people. And that was, I said before, about 18 miles from Bethany, where Martha and Mary and Lazarus lived. So when these sisters saw that their brother was deteriorating and he was nowhere in sight, they decided they are not going to take any chances. They sent a messenger to tell Jesus, and here was the language, He whom thou lovest is sick. In other words, they were saying, because of your love for him, you are going to want to come instantly. This is not just simply because we are friends or because we are we have a relationship with you or because we do well. But we want you to understand the one whom you love. So that in itself, beloved, tells me that Martha and Mary had the idea that there would be nothing that Jesus will not do for them because they were looking to him on the basis of his love for them. Now I think I want to take a little time and stop here. Because there are some tremendous nuggets that we can glean from this story. Apart from just the fact that it has the shortest verse in the Bible. 
it will be instructive to you and to me also. They did not say, Jesus, because of the many favors we did for you, or because of the many times you stopped in at our home and refreshed you, or because of how committed we were, or because of how involved we were in attending to you and supporting you and showing our commitment to you. On that basis, Jesus, you owe us the favor and you ought to come. They could have said that. But what is so very instructive is that they said, He whom thou lovest. In other words, we are concerned that the only thing, Father, or Jesus, that will make you want to come is because of your love. The Bible declares, beloved, that God loves you, that God sent his son into the world because he loved you. And when you understand that, that Jesus loves you, and that love he has for you will never become hate. That love will never change. The Bible declared in John chapter 13 that Jesus, having known that the purpose why he came to earth was fulfilled, it says, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the very end. As the Chinese proverb says, he loved them to the bottom. There's nothing that Jesus will not do for you because he loves you. And Martha and Mary, they are tapping into that quality. They are tapping into that value. They are tapping into that attribute, the love. The Bible declares that God's love is everlasting. That God's love will never change. He said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with love and kindness have I drawn you unto myself. And I am instructed, beloved. I am helped. I am blessed by the way that this sent the message. He whom thy soul lovest. In other words, Jesus, your love for our brother is not just mouth love. It's not just head love. Your very soul loves him. The love you have for our brother comes from the depth of your being. The love that you have for our brother comes from the very gut of your being. It is a love from the bottom of your heart. He whom your soul loveth, he is sick. And when Jesus got the message, he said, This sickness is not unto death. Let us stop there a little while. Beloved, Jesus was not saying that this sickness will not cause him to die. That is not what it meant. Because if it meant that, you could have said that Jesus miscalculated or Jesus failed or Jesus made a mistake or Jesus was wrong or Jesus lied. But none of that is true because he did not say that Lazarus will not die. He was saying this sickness is not unto death. In other words, he's saying death is not the ultimate issue here. Death is not the bigger picture. Death is not the focus of this sickness. This sickness was not there to uh, facilitate death. That is not the picture. There's a bigger picture. There's something beyond death. The ball does not end in the court of death. It's like you saying, for example, I have built myself a ladder as a means unto an end. And that mean is the ladder. And the end is to be able to reach the bulbs 
that are high up in the ceiling. You get the idea? So the bigger picture is not just simply the ladder. It is a mean unto an end. And the end is to help you to access, to facilitate you reaching the bulb in the ceiling. So the ceiling bulb is the bigger picture. But the ladder is only a mean, an issue to get you there. So when Jesus said, this sickness is not unto, that was not the focus. That was not the end of it all. Death will happen, yes. But the bigger picture is what will come out of that death. Is what will come out. And what will come out is, but for the glory of God. And later on, in the same chapter 11, he told disciples in verse 9 that he was glad. Let me find the exact verse here. In verse 15, matter of fact. And I'm glad that for your sake that I was not there to the intent you may believe. So he said, that is the bigger picture. One, that God will get some glory and two, that you will believe. It will do something to your faith. It will do something to you for the remainder of your life. So that is not really the equation. That is not. You got to see beyond that. And I'm saying to you, beloved, you got to see the bigger picture. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations and we don't know. And at that point in time, the enemy of our soul and the enemy of the salvation that we have and the enemy of the God whom we serve will jump on your shoulder and try to accuse God of having abandoned you. Accuse God of failing you. Accusing God of not being concerned about you. There are times when the devil may even try to convince you that you have missed God. You got married to that man. Or you got married to that woman. And you know from the depths of your soul that this was God's gift to you. You know that this husband of yours is God sent. And you know that this wife of yours is God sent. And you'll put your head on the block and say, man, I was seeking God. And God really gave me my wife. But after a while, you begin to see certain traits. You begin to see certain behavioral pattern in your wife or your husband and you begin to doubt, I wonder if I miss God and you begin to feel guilty that you are out of God's will because if it were God, that wife would have never be eternal what she is and if it were God, that husband would never be what he is. And the devil wants to make you believe that it was God, wasn't God, that you have missed God. And because you want to get back into God's will, you decide not to divorce your husband and divorce your wife. Come on, beloved. Don't you fall in that trap. God knows the type of a husband that you need to make you the woman you ought to become. And God knows the type of a man, woman you need to make you the man you ought to become. And God has actually orchestrated that marriage that you will be able to have in your life a type of a woman that you have to try to straighten you up and to try to bring out the real character that you never even realized was inside of you. So don't doubt God. Look at the bigger picture. When you are jacked up against the wall, rather than asking why, 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 and trying to cry, and trying to blaspheme, and trying to doubt God, and trying to accuse God, 
stand still and say, God, what do you want me to learn out of this? What do you want to make happen? What are you saying to me in this situation? I'm your child. I know you love me. I don't think I missed you when I made the decision. But here am I now, Lord, at a dead end street. Here am I facing something I can't even begin to decipher. Lord, I am standing still to hear what you have to say. I'm not going to doubt you because I know that you love me. I know that you care about me. So rather than trying to lose my faith, rather than trying to lose my focus, I'm going to ask myself, let me stand still and see the salvation of my God. Like Moses with the children of Israel in the wilderness, when they began to murmur and began to weep and to wail and began to complain and wanted even to stone Moses to death, he told them, come on, stand still. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord your God. They could not believe it because here they were told by Moses that God is going to lead them out. God is going to set them free. And they believed it and they saw it happening. They obeyed Moses. And that night, they put on their sandals and they took their staff in their hand and they got their animals and they got their children and by hundreds and thousands, they are marching out. And I believe while they are marching, they are singing songs of praise. And then, suddenly, they come to the Red Sea. A body of water nine miles wide. And they, it's impossible. We can't <laughs> go. We can't swim here. We have no boat. And to add salt in the wound. When they look back behind them. Whom did they see? The ferocious advance. Of Pharaoh's army, his most celebrated chariots, kicking up dust, coming at them. No wonder they began to murmur and to bawl and to wail and to think that Moses had tricked them or God had tricked them. But Buddha said, Stand still and see. Stand still and see. And beloved, the time does come when you are going to face circumstances. And even now, you may be facing a circumstance that has you jacked up against the wall that there seems to be no way out. That thing that you are facing is not unto your destruction. It's not unto your failure. It's not unto your demise. It is not unto your shame. It is not unto your disgrace. You might be thinking that it will disgrace you. It will shame you. It will fail you. It will destroy you. It will kill you. But that is not the purpose. Stand still. And see the bigger picture. Lord, I don't understand. But what is it you want me to learn? What are you really saying to me in this situation? I want to share with you a testimony. In the year 2013, the enemy attacked my body without warning. I never had any symptoms. I never had any precondition. But on that Sunday... In March 2013, that Sunday night, 
my body came under heavy attack. In the morning it worsened. And the Monday morning I ended up in a health facility in South Trinidad. Excruciating pain. I mean I don't want my dog to ever go through that pain. I don't want even my worst enemy to encounter that pain. And there was I in the casualty department with tubes in my body. Pain. And I'm losing blood. And I'm groaning in pain. I can't. I mean, it, it was terrible. And then, I remember I said to God, I said, Father, if I did not know that you understand the motivation of man's heart, I would never ask you the question I'm about to ask you. But God, you know that the question I'm about to ask you is not out of arrogance. It's not out of trying to accuse you. But because I know you understand, I'm asking you, Lord, the question. Lord, why am I where I am? Why am I in this place? This is not who I am. This is not my testimony. This is not what I preach. This is not what I believe. God, why? What is happening to me? And I kept quiet. And after 15 seconds, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said to me, You are in this place. To observe human suffering. That you will go out from here. And bring deliverance to those who are suffering. And when I heard I say thank you father. The pain did not stop. The bleeding did not stop. My agony did not stop. But I began to praise God. And in about 50 minutes, a man came in bawling, groaning, and just simply bawling in pain, asking the nurses, asking the doctor, oh God, help me, help me, help me. And just bawling, I mean, incessantly, out of control, bawling, screaming in pain. They put him in a bed near to me and they screen him around and I'm saying oh my God I should have been on my feet ministering to a man like that but here am I with two of them in the bed I can't get off and in half an hour time the man was dead I asked the nurse what is wrong they said he's gone and they put him in a body bag to go to San Fernando for autopsy. And like a while after that, they had zipped the man up. A young woman came in, crawling on both her hands and her knees, crying for pain, groaning, begging the nurses to help, help, no, help, help, help. Help, help me, help me. Crying. And my heart went out. Then I understood what God said. You are here to observe human suffering. That you can go out from here to bring deliverance to those who are suffering. And God delivered me. Today I am healthy, I'm strong, I'm well. I'm whole. That problem doesn't exist. What folk thought it was, it never was. And thank God... And God has said, I'll give you back your life. That you can go and bring deliverance. And that reminds me, God has always reminded me, your first anointing is deliverance. And I want you to know, my friend, what you are going through now. Maybe you can understand. This COVID-19, you couldn't understand. But God is going to bring many of you out of this with a passion for souls. God is going to bring many of you out of this with a deliverance ministry. 
God is going to bring many of you out of there with a love for people that you never had. God is going to bring many of you out of this with an appreciation for the house of God and for involvement in ministry that hitherto you might never have had. God is youth in this that I can sit and train that in front of a camera and get results from folk in London, from India, from Pennsylvania, from Canada, from North America, from the Caribbean, from St. Vincent, from St. Lucia. I mean, it is amazing. God. This death said, this sickness is not unto death. Yes, he may die. But that is not the ultimate. That is not the motivation. There's a bigger picture. And Jesus wanted the disciples to know that they must see beyond the negative. They must see beyond what they will see. They must hear beyond what they will hear. And he see the bigger picture. And hear the bigger picture of what is taking place. God may have you right now in a place of isolation that you can turn your head around and minister grace to somebody on a bed near to you. God has put you where you are now that you will have access to somebody to whom you might not have had access. God might have delayed your deliverance from that thing that is so inconvenient to you to give you an indomitable faith in God that nothing with God is impossible, which you would not have had had it not been for what you are going through right now. In the meantime, God wants to set you free. God wants you to come to an end of your complaining. God wants you to come to an end of seeing the negative. God wants you to see the answer. Maybe you have been praying for this situation for a long time. You have been reading every promise in the book for a long time. And the time has come God is saying, you have learned the lesson. Now I'm going to visit you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to set you free. And the Lord said to the disciples, I am glad <laughs> that I wasn't there for your sake. Because it will do something to your faith. It will make you believe. It will make you become a warrior in bringing deliverance to people in their situation. And take away every doubt you might have had as to whether I am the Messiah. Beloved, so turn. Give God praise. In everything, give thanks. In everything. Not for, but in it. Let your attitude change. Let your disposition change. Let your language change. Paul and Silas sang praises to God at midnight with their backs bleeding. Your attitude in your situation will determine your altitude in your relationship with God. And even now, you may have to ask God to forgive you for the attitude you might have had, for the complaining you have complained, and for the doubts you have engendered in your heart. And say, God, forgive me. And now I have got, learned a lesson. Now I am equipped. Lord, I am now ready to surrender my body, my mind, and my soul for my healing. Beloved, I am feeling this thing way down in my spirit. That God is doing something quiet in the heart of somebody. And that somebody is you. And I want to ask you. If you have never believed God like you are believing God now. Lay your hand upon your chest. Or on your forehead. And receive your deliverance now. I'm about to pray the prayer of faith. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I release resurrection power and virtue into that room, in that vehicle, Lord, in that enclosure. I release the virtue of the resurrected Christ. I release the anointing of the Holy Spirit by which the yoke is destroyed. And I release the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And I command that the atmosphere, I command that the environment be charged with the reality of the risen Christ that he is alive. And God, I ask you now that you will endorse the word I speak in your name. Now, you foul spirit of affliction, you spirit of bondage, in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. I command you, take your hand off the people of God. I command you, seed of affliction, you spirit of infirmity, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. I command you to lose your hold. Father, that wheezing on the chest, that wheezing on the chest, I rebuke it now. I command it to be free. I command the air passages to be free in the name of Jesus. I call forth a miracle. I proclaim it as being done, Lord. I release virtue that comes from the touch of the Holy Ghost. I release it now. And I command it to be done in the name of Jesus. Lord, I give you thanks. I give you thanks. In Jesus' name. And now, Father, for those who have never accepted Christ as their Savior, let the Holy Ghost convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Save souls now. And let that gentleman make inquiries as to how he can know that he is born again. Father, I lift every family. I lift every household. I lift every situation now. Supply every need, Lord. Open up that job opportunity and give your people back their jobs in the name of Jesus, I pronounce it done for your honor and for your glory. And we say thank you in Christ's name. Amen. You're going to observe that I just mentioned one aspect of the, of the entire thing. Next week I continue on this. Seeing the bigger picture part two. And I know we're going to continue in this one. There are so many truths, beloved. And I trust that you're going to look at it again. May God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. And don't forget to join us on Sunday morning at 9.45 for our continuation part three on justification. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.